Hey guys, welcome to Rock Talks. Today we're talking to Jeremy Creamer, former bassist of Duff and Chimera, and current frontman of Hot Pink Satan. We discuss how was the transition from playing metal to being this crazy electronic project, their unique life experience, and more. If you like this interview, please give me a thumbs up, leave a comment, and share the video with all your friends. Also, very important, please don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell. By the way, if you see a little advertisement at the beginning, in the middle, or at the end of the video, please do not skip it. By doing that, you're helping me a lot. Come on, guys, it's just a few seconds of your life, and it will really make a difference for me. I'm counting on all of you. Enjoy the interview. Hello, Jeremy. Thank you so much for your time, man. How are you? Welcome to Rock Talks. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I'm doing uh, doing pretty well, man. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to come on your show and talk. Uh, I've enjoyed a couple of the episodes, and uh, I'm a fan. So, oh, nice. Welcome, welcome to the uh, the Alina Line Studio here, and uh, it's good to be here. Thanks. Thank you so much for the kind words. Yeah, I, I had the chance to interview a couple of former members from Dab and Chimera, so this 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 one should be interesting as well. But yeah, so uh, I also know you're uh, you are a big fan of the Doth Mera, so I we yeah. all appreciate your online support during that, as everyone decided. Uh, what they liked and hated about that, so it was nice to uh, have you on the team. Yeah, Duff Myra. Yeah, <laughs> I remember the the name from the band. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, but let's start talking about the the present because it's very okay, important. It. It's very important to focus on new pro new projects and new stuff. So please tell me about your project called Hot Pink Satan. To me, it sounds like a mix between pop and electronic music, but it it, it also sounds really really dark, right? Yeah, uh, a lot of that, uh, me and my bandmate, Clea, we kind of share this aesthetic of loving that like late 80s kind of industrial post-punk kind of thing. And she's she's a riot girl with the best of them. So um, when you listen to like the record, it is very like ministry twitch where it's just beats and dark vocals. Um, little bit of kind of a Lords of Acid kind of content thrown in there with the sexuality and everything. And then, uh, but if you come see us live, you know, I'm ripping the bass through a bass amp and a guitar amp, and it's like very punk and she's bleeding everywhere. It's, it's, <laughs> it's a riot. So it kind of has two faces. If you listen to the record, it's a little bit more for your brain, but when you see us in the club, it's like very high energy, very punk rock, uh, and very right girl with her on the mic. Yeah, yeah, it, it has a, a very, uh, it's, it's really visual, you know, it, it, it impacts on people, especially because uh, the lady with, uh, that's next to you, it's almost naked. So how did you come up with that idea? Um, well, she is a amazing solo performance artist in her own right. Um, she's a friend we had from Berlin and she was doing burlesque and variety and uh, kind of ride girl and performance art kind of things with bands in Europe uh, that were signed to Warner. And she's kind of a kind of was a big American expat that was living in Berlin with the community there. Um, so she kind of developed that in those years and then we got together and wrote the, the record. And when it came to go out and do the live show, both of us kind of wanted the live show to be a complete step up from the record where like, if you were a fan of it, you know, a lot of, a lot of times, especially in my metal, you know, days where that was primarily what I was doing, uh, a lot of people would sit there and computerize these records to the point where they kind of had to live up to playing something that maybe they didn't necessarily play into the computer. Um, mm -hmm. So we wanted to do something totally different where it was like, well, the record is the basic song and the emotion and the feel and go for the visual and the aesthetic and the, the audio picture. But then when you come and see us live, there's twice as many things going on, you know, so 
Um, so through when we developed the live show, she brought just as much of her performance art and dance background into it um, as her musical ability. And it really ended up working out well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I got the chance to see, uh, to watch a couple of videos uh, of you guys playing live. And it's really interesting, really, really good stuff. So yeah. how did you, how did, um, good. How did you jump from metal to play this kind of electronic music? Because like you said, it's not a, like a regular electronic band. It's really different, but how did you actually move from here to, to there? Yeah, um, I think really to answer that question, you kind of have to go way further back. Um, I grew up a, doing the classically trained route, playing upright bass in the symphony. Um, and I spent much of my youth and my summers doing that all the way to in Atlanta where I'm from and where Doth is from. You know, I was in like the Atlanta Symphony Youth Orchestra and we played like the closing ceremonies at the Olympics when the Olympics were in Atlanta. Um, we did recordings with Michael Kamen, some really, uh, some really good classical music moments. And then I decided instead of auditioning and trying to be in a symphony and going to school for that, I ended up going to Berkeley College of Music. Um, but at the time, I was kind of more in a band from my youth that was more like old Pink Floyd or, or kind of grungy or rocky stuff at that point, or, or just really a different, or I was really into trip hop with like Tricky and Portishead and Massive Attack and those kind of bands because I'm very much a 90s kid. Um, <laughs> and I went to Berkeley on the advice of my friend Deontane Parks, which if you look up him, he, he used to play with the Mars Volta. He's an amazing drummer, one of the best drummers. He's your favorite drummer's favorite drummer. <laughs> um, and he's pretty legendary, but he told me to come up to Berkeley. So I went there studied all sorts of music uh, and jammed with tons of different bands, but really ended up in heavy metal once I left there and met Eyal from Doth um, in Atlanta, because he had an ad up for a heavy metal electronic band, which was the first Doth demo that was out at the time. Um, and they were making Futility and that kind of led me to the career in heavy metal. I'd always been a fan, you know, I grew up loving Tool and Pantera and Helmet and like all these, you know, the oh, first Sepultura. Hell yeah. The, the uh, you know, the first like Sepultura record that we, that was big with us here, like really like changed my mind. I have all these metal moments, but I wasn't necessarily playing heavy metal until I reconnected after college with AL. And, uh, and in a weird, thing when I was doing classical music, I had actually performed under his father conducting when I was in high school. And that was actually kind of the, one of the things that when we got together that was interesting because I was like, like, oh yeah, I played under your dad. He was like, oh, that's pretty cool. And <laughs> we kind of had a really big classical music connection there um, that was even bigger than the heavy metal. And you can kind of hear that in a lot of the music as well. Oh, yeah. um, but really, Heavy metal was kind of the thing I got to do the, the big touring on, and that was very special and everything. But the whole time I've actually been really into electronic music. And, um, you know, I kind of grew up listening to the Revolting Cox and Old Ministry and Einster's End and <clears throat> The Cure and all these other things that, uh, that I'm doing now. I'm just kind of doing because the metal gig isn't there, but the, the metal gig showed up and I went, I love that band so, so much. And the classical influence really came to be a big part of everything involved. Um, so, so that's the long, <laughs> the long thing <laughs> coming back that kind of metal ended up being the surprise. And I've been trying to be a trip hop kind of guy forever really. <laughs> You know, so it was a really, a really, a, a, a really big musical journey for you. Your yeah, life. for sure. I really listen and love almost every kind of music that has a heart and soul. And if growing up, I was really lucky to have, you know, 
people surrounding me that taught me to love all kinds of music and art and creativity. So metal is just one of those beautiful things in the fold where you can uh, go to church and get all those aggressions out in metal church. Uh, and it's just such a great community and great music that I love it. You know, it's like, it's the time to go be extreme, you know? <laughs> yeah, because not, not, not many metal musicians uh, get the chance to do that, you know, to move from metal to electronic music. The, the only one that I remember is Igor Cavalera from uh, Sepultura, oh, sure, yeah. Conspiracy, right? With Mixed Hell. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I mean, famously, uh, Sonny, you know, Skrillex, you know, he came from a van band and went off and he's probably the, the biggest guy. And that was like kind of the era when I was reconnecting anyway, because that was kind of the era when, you know, there was like groups of us on the road that would bring laptops into the van and while everyone else was partying, we'd be in headphones, just kind of, mm -hmm. you know, a bunch of us nerds, uh, <laughs> you know, cause the, the boundary for entry at that point and for production had just, you know, the wall had gotten kicked down, you know, it used to be a million dollars to start a studio and now it's, $1,500 to get a great laptop. So yeah, yeah. if you had that interest at that time, I think like so many of us just delved right into it very strongly, you know? Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, you told me that your main current project is something called Alina Line. Did I say yeah. that right? Yeah, that's uh, basically the, the name or moniker I've been using for anything that involves me on the production side, you know, because okay. it kind of, it separates, you know, Jeremy, you know, as a player from, I had a hand in arranging, producing, recording, and selling this thing. So, so I do perform concerts under the name of Linaline, and I, I perform a lot of the works that I do even with other bands. Um, but that really is just kind of an umbrella statement for I'm behind the scenes on this, you know, and uh, and helping with the aesthetic and everything like that, you know, uh, like with my band Hopping Satan, I produced the record, we made our own videos. I've taken a very DIY, you know, technology has opened the doors for so many things for all of us, um, even us speaking here today, you know, hey, honestly. Absolutely. Uh, so, you know, maybe 2010, you know, in, in when everything started to kind of really become accessible and connected, uh, as all of my friends were building these huge studios, I was finding the potential <laughs> of one plug and a laptop and, you know, making videos with camera, you know, I would take uh, like two telephones and hold them up and across so I could play audio on one, videotape on the other, and I would go and like steel sets in Europe, I would go to like the French catacombs and go down in the catacombs with these two phones on the tour and just kind of hang back for like 10 minutes and shoot a music video there. Cause they would never give somebody like me a permit unless I had just tons <laughs> of money. Um, so I've kind of been on a, a journey to make creativity more accessible, you know, cause they, the, yeah the price of entry used to be very high and now it's very low. And of course that makes it very saturated, but it also gives anybody with a true voice, you know, a very, very vast sea of people to connect with. Mm -hmm. What does Alina line means? It's actually the words all in a line, all oh. in a line. All right, <laughs> clever. <laughs> you know, and it, and it has some, connotations to you know I find here like in America you know if 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 there's a line at the gas station people will just get it in it you know it's almost like and I would notice this I, I would notice this you know it's, I guess now they call that FOMO or what you know fear of missing out or um mm -hmm. but there's that kind of thing that mentality and and the name and the art there also addresses some of that uh because I've always been a very punk rock kid in the you know, in the social aspect, not, you know, the gimmicky dress up hop top side, but I love music that has a message and a meaning and that's for people. Uh, that's really kind of what drives me. So kind of everything has little hidden 
symbolism and meaning, including that name, that you can kind of dig a little deeper into if you want to take a look. Yeah, interesting. Most people get in a line, but they don't know what for. <laughs> yeah, in a way, you know. And it really is, it says just so much, you know, art now has become a consumable instead of a conversation. Um, and some of those things you can really feel people longing for. And when it when it hits right, it hits amazingly. You know, if you look at a band like Rage Against the Machine or something where they connect with people all around the world about something bigger, you know, nobody, you know, it's like, it's bigger than life and it changes people completely. And those are the things I love, even back in classical music, you know, these, these guys were, these composers were hired by kings and, you know, they would take their money, but put in peasant songs or little themes that the kings didn't know, making very large social statements, um, you know, even hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And that's kind of the bigger thing about art is the deeper connectivity and conversation you can have. And I, that's kind of the main thing I do regardless. It doesn't matter if it's metal or, you know, a drag show or, mm -hmm a piece of art on the wall, you know, it's all the same. You know, when I painted my house, I had that same thought process. And it's, it's, it's more just that this isn't just people playing instruments and doing things. This is a level of communication that's on a different plane, you know? Yeah, I agree. So any touring plans for this year or maybe 2022 for Hot Pink Satan or, or any other project with you? Well, right now, we had kind of finished our natural cycle right when the pandemic occurred. Um, so at this point, we're going to go back into a writing cycle. Well, I was doing some Alinaline shows and some other stuff in, that me and my partner here in Pittsburgh do with burlesque and variety. And, um, but we're still taking it pretty cautiously right now as numbers get interesting again with the pandemic. Um, we've only been having outside events so far and I work for Live Nation and they're, they're very good about testing and masks and um, to have us work there. But, you know, we're still as, as event, especially as event promoters beyond just playing shows, you know, there's a large responsibility to try to keep our customers and community safe. Um, and we're still kind of balancing that out and seeing how that goes right now. So, so touring right now, hopefully next year, we'll get really into it. But right now we've been trying to connect this way. Uh, I've been, we let out a Hot Pink Satan live record and I let out an Alinaline live record to kind of give people that sense of where we were and they could kind of have the performance at home, um, no matter where you are without the burden of us traveling everywhere. Uh, and I need it. I, I personally, this has been the first year I actually haven't been playing two traveling live shows since I was a very young child. So, you know, like 10 years old or something. So I miss it dearly. And it's, I, I hope for a world very soon that we can come right back to it. But for the moment, we're doing limited stuff locally. And I've been doing mini remixes and kind of doing a lot of production stuff for bands remotely right now. Um, and that's been a really great thing, actually, because I've gotten to work with a bunch of people you wouldn't naturally work with if you were maybe on a tour of a bunch of the same kind of music, you know? Yeah, the key is to keep it busy. Some yeah, way exactly. or another. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. That, that's, that's how this uh, YouTube channel exists. And I got to be boring. I was, yeah. trying, I was, I was looking for a hobby. I was, I was really bored at home. <laughs> well, and, you're doing a great thing. It's really awesome to uh, see how many interviews you've gotten with everybody. And it's cool to have these like deeper conversations that aren't naturally like sponsored by gear or a record yeah. label release, you know, to just have these natural conversations about all these people and where they come from and why they do what they do. It's a, it's a cool thing. So thank you for spending your time doing it. It's, it's nice to have as a resource for us all. Yeah, you're welcome, man. So let's talk about uh, the metal chapter of your life. You know, yeah, your, for sure. Your days with that. 
So my yeah. first question is, any chance for a Duff reunion tour or a one-off gig? Maybe next year? If you like this interview, please give me a thumbs up, leave a comment, and share the video with all your friends. Also, very important, please don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell.